Mecha is back. Well, at least to me, after Armored Core 6's amazing success. Both as a commercial success that made tons of people who aren't usually interested in Mecha want to know more, and also just being an absolutely amazing game. Personally, this propelled my and many others' desire to consume more Mecha, like binging the Witch for Mercury, <laughs> Gundam C, buying Armor Core kits and Gumpla, but more importantly for this video, Revisiting the old Armored Core games of my childhood, to see where Armored Core games really came from, and to look into a bit from software's past. So, I, after getting addicted to Mecha again and slightly distracted by fear and hunger, but ignore that part. I just woke up in a fucking steaming mood, yeah? Do you know what I mean? It's a fucking shithole! I hate the fucking place! I fucking hate it! It's full of dickheads! I fucking hate it! Chose the best place to start, with the game that had one of the most iconic openings to any game. For answer, the Dark Souls actually. Uh, wait, this game came out before Demon Souls, so is Demon Souls and Souls the Armored Core of Fantasy? But why am I talking about Armored Core For Answer first, the sequel to Armored Core Four? Well, before we talk about For Answer, we have to understand what Armored Core was up to this point, as well as the game before it in its timeline, Armored Core Four. Armored Core as a franchise has had multiple iterations through the many games over the years with different takes on the gameplay. We organized these into generations, with Gen 1 being Armored Core 1 to Master Arena. These games had relatively tight gameplay with very little space that was usually maze-like in its design. Armored Core customization was still a highlight here with plenty of ways to make them your own, with combat itself being more focused on grounded slow combat. Armored Cores themselves were piloted by people known as Ravens, and in combat, they weren't even that common, usually only used for boss fights, instead fielding most of the fight with generic fodder. The soundtracks were also techno-cyberpunkish opposed to the orchestral tracks we get a lot of now. Gen 2, which had ironically only two games, improved on this from a gameplay point of view, removing a lot of the frankly, really, really janky feeling to the controls. Getting into 3 with this absolute list of games was essentially just Armored Core classic gameplay, refined to almost perfection after all the years of work. There were more customizations and gameplay options while the game took a bit of a more tactical approach, making the latter games in the generation much more harder than what came before. Admittedly, the jink from these previous generations is still around for most of the games even with the improvements made, but this is a combination of two issues. There was an absolute ton of controls, which today doesn't look like a lot, oh but back then you remember these awfully oh, tiny oh, controllers. Oh, Seriously, look how big these are when you're an adult, it's, it's actually shocking. It was at the point where the armored core grip was named, where you would hold your controller upside down and play better, so it's no surprise there's gonna be issues. Issues that Generation 4 tried and for the most part succeeded in fixing. And it's the most important to talk about before we touch for answer. Unlike a lot of people, since this game sold awfully like what the fuck. 
Pyrocore 4 is a video Gaming. game that lets us kill two birds with one stone, because 4 Answer is essentially exactly like 4, but relies on it for story reasons. The basic rundown of the story is in the distant future on actually Earth, we are Anatolia's Raven, a raven who pilots the newest generation of armor cores known as Nex for, well, Anatolia, a country that is independent of the New World Order run entirely by corporations. And we are getting hawked out to their services to do anything they need, as we need to be able to fund our home. Think of it like Fallout 3 leading into New Vegas, kind of. It was published by Ubisoft, of all companies, and looked at everything the franchise did before, and seek to improve it by reworking everything from the ground up. Pretty much everything is different in terms of gameplay design, with levels for the most part being big and open, with your ADC design being exceptionally important with more options than ever at this point, while not being super important as you can beat the game with anything as long as you play well. Meanwhile, the design of the game took advantage of PS3's new hardware, making it more similar to the new games with big levels, fast movement, and more 4D combat. There's just one problem you might have noticed. Both games are PS3 games. 599 US dollars. And we're not about cutting corners to rush a product to market. Whoops. Uh, Genji 2 is an action game which is based on Japanese history. The images of the game will also be based on famous battles which took, actually took place in ancient Japan. So here's this giant enemy crab. Very early generation, in fact. Games that don't have ports or official ways to get them anymore without a PC. Luckily for me, I, um... I found a legit copy some, some, somewhere that was compatible with our PCS3 so I could play them on my PC. It's the only way to play the games now and has some issues despite the total legitness of it. So if you see any weird texture stuff, it's, it's not the game, it's me, it's the emulator. I did make sure to try to get as close to a PS3 experience as possible though since I do actually own a couple PS3 controllers. A controller that made a big difference in the gameplay department from the previous generations. Enabling the 4D movement we all know as well as being far more aggressive and way less jank than the other games. Enabling us now to have weapons on our shoulders on top of the 4 that we usually have. Which is still a little weird to get used to because you can't fire hand weapons and back weapons at the same time, requiring you to swap between them. Passively, you have something known as primal armor, uh, well armor, that reduces damage but can also be used as a resource for over boosting. It is very important because there's no healing in this game, meaning any and all damage reduction is greatly valued. A little different, but even then the parts customization is very, very similar to what new fans might know, with most parts and components doing about the same thing. You can change every single bit of the next with every part doing something somewhat different with a giant wall of stats that really don't matter too much to the average person at the end of the day. I personally defaulted once again to using tetrapods to carry a ton of weapons, of which you got a lot of options. There are rapid fire SMGs which melt targets, really powerful melee that can slice apart slow or heavy equipment, heavy cannons or missile launchers, energy weapons, and even weapons that replace your whole arms, which I would actually like to see come back in the newer games. Another thing though is tuning points which I almost forgot about, and if you're new to the series will look a little overwhelming. You get points by just playing the game and doing arenas. You can use these to boost any stat you'd like by a set amount, allowing you to fine tune your next however you'd like or need, such as fitting more heavy weapons than you could normally. This gives you good reason to play the arena, but also the missions on hard because they offer extra points and even equipment from new enemies. Those heavy weapons also feel even more powerful as if you don't use stabilizers which make your unit more stable, you can even stun yourself by just firing the weapon. Unfortunately, the sound design and animations aren't really great at delivering the power you seem to have with all sounds really not being particularly amazing. is actually a big issue with enemies in general, with enemy normals, which are old armor cores, which aren't really special, and enemy vehicles like helicopters or tanks not really feeling fun to fight, as well as not standing out at all. Every now and then there's a somewhat unique enemy that adds a little spice, like these melee guys you just run away from, but besides enemy next fights, there isn't really much special about anything you're fighting. Most fights, as a result, often just feel like throwing ammo at each other to the enemy hopefully dies, because they don't really have actual reactions to your attacks, they just kind of take the damage and then explode. 
This game, in my opinion, also has the absolutely worst shop in the franchise. They decided to merge the garage and shop, meaning all weapons are all bundled together where you own them or not. Which is kind of annoying because when you're scrolling through your garage, you have to scroll through all of the weapons you do and don't own making the list really long, especially from the beginning, so it's kind of hard to find things you actually do own sometimes. On top of that, the arena, now known as the simulator, is hidden in the menus here and took me actually forever to find. When you do figure stuff out eventually, you can do missions like normal, which is pretty fun for the most part with a decent variety of requirements. Newer players might be surprised by how rough the money can be, with it being really easy to actually owe money after the sortie. Luckily, you can save yourself some cash by using energy weapons or some missions having ammo quotas, which they expect you to use, and thus will cover that much for you. If you manage to use less than whatever they expected from you, that is considered a bonus. The graphics were also updated to be, um, kind of ugly looking for an early PS3 title, but it's not absolutely terrible. Environments are also pretty bland with not much inhabiting it or around it, but they do use good color from time to time. Art direction really does carry this and for answer really hard, but even a diehard fan like me it has to admit it's only barely, as with a lack of actual things in the environment that are interesting, there's not much space for the art design to actually shine. All of this was actually done to support, well, the title of this video and what Gen 4 is known for, and that's its absolutely insanely fast speed in breakneck combat. You can have a decent frame rate on these old consoles with this speed without the barren environments, and they make sure to take advantage of that and does a really good job making you feel like you're going that fast too, turning fights into insanely visceral events where I caught myself moving in my chair all the time. It helps the controls are a bit less janky than the previous games with pretty good feeling 4D combat. You can dash in any direction which feels really responsive and great when spamming to evade or get closer. Hover above the ground to slide, use overboost to quickly rush a direction at the cost of your primal armor and draining your energy, and fly up which is the only part that felt a little janky at times, but worked once you get the hang of it. But there are some instances in this game where missions do not feel good to traverse or seem unreasonably unfair even with all these options. Two big examples would be this early mission where you are defending a ship on ice from subs. These subs show up really fast and they need to be destroyed immediately, but the ice you walk on sucks if you don't fly or hover, and the animations themselves are really weird, often making me not feel like I'm doing enough damage, which is an issue across the board. The other example is this mission to stop missiles from attacking a city. It used good color, but it's so weird with the darkness of night that I kind of felt like I was doing something wrong till it finally said I destroyed all the missiles. However, that's not the biggest downside of 4. It's actually that the story really isn't that great, but unfortunately is actually important to understand what is happening in For Answer. And it's not bad because it's a bad story. The concepts and ideas are actually pretty good and interesting, and once you beat For Answer, you appreciate them. It's just all of these ideas are executed fairly poorly in 4, with the story being what is essentially a backdrop, with events that just kind of happen. For instance, the last boss of the game is supposed to be a character that our handler is friends with, but we interact with him so little with very easy to miss dialogue that it doesn't really feel like the emotional event they wanted it to be with this music. Hey. I guess there's little need for words. Uh, who is this again? It doesn't help no voice acting across the board, it, it, it's not really great. Hey, um, Mal from the future here, or maybe it's the past now. I realized while editing this that the voice acting isn't just bad, it's actually mixed really awfully as well. You'll see with a lot of these upcoming examples that the voice acting isn't great, but it is also almost impossible to hear in some of these scenarios, and I'm not actually gonna isolate it like I originally thought, because it you really have to see how badly this is mixed. Just like I said, die, run away. This can't be. I'm just 
describe most of this game. Not great. I personally am surprised I didn't enjoy 4 that much, and kind of just went through the motions not really caring. I chalk it up to this game's paper-thin plot, once again delivered through a mission structure doing jobs for whoever hires you. So let's talk about this story real quick. You played as Anatolia's, which I didn't what actually know was a real place, Raven, taking jobs from the various corporations. Uh, there's a lot of them, in fact, which, after the world's governments failed humanity, took over during something known as the National Dismantlement War, with our new armor cores known as Necks, which are piloted by Ravens known as Lynxes. Empowered with Kojima, Hideo, particles, Kojima an incredibly destructive element that destroys the environment. After the war, Pax Economica was established, which was a world controlled by governments which ended up much worse under their control. Years later, our handler Fiona and us while working for Anatolia are hired to take on multiple missions against multiple threats to the Pax Economica, namely the Maghreb Liberation Front fighting against the current world order. You get jobs and missions lists that you can handle any work you like as long as you don't do the ones that specifically end the chapter. You destroy the faction over time while learning it was funded by the corpse in the first place to undermine each other, but it became too powerful and needed to be removed as many factions had begun actually joining them. Eventually, they have enough and a war breaks out on Earth once again. Throughout all of this, we can tell that our operator cares for us actually deeply and wants to get away with us when this is all over. All of this is so unfair to ask of you. Once this war is over, let's get away from all of this. We stop a corporation known as Raylian Art Strike Team made it before next in a really fun fight. This will actually be a really important mission later, trust me. Then move to end the company while our co-worker Joshua O'Brien and his white glint deals with Aquavit, the company that arguably started the war with both companies' assets being taken in by various groups, but mostly a company known as Omer. At this point, the corporations, specifically Omer, fear Anatolia's mercenaries' independence and power as they're an uncontrolled entity that they cannot stop. So blackmail a solution. O'Brien is sent to and destroys Anatolia, and we kill him, ending our own little war. This not only left our colony destroyed, but also most of the world contaminated, leaving our main character nowhere to call home and leaves, leading us into the ruined world of Armored Core for answer. This is for the best. Now if you can tell, I really didn't enjoy 4 too much and truthfully don't think it's a good game. So what makes 4 Answer different, even though it's essentially the same game? Well 4 Answer just takes everything that Armored Core 4 had and improves on it on every level without actually changing much. In terms of gameplay, it's somehow faster with new weapons added while maintaining the main mechanics. Just adding Primal Armor expansion, which acts just like AC6's offensive armor. The game also has pretty decent effects as well, that look pretty good when blowing up ships and groups with heavy weapons, or just going for the kill with your Moonlight Greatsword. Just looking at some gameplay, you can probably tell the movement in this game is near perfect for fast paced, responsive, almost Gundam like speed. One tiny nitpick is going vertical just like an Armor Core 4 still doesn't feel great to me, which I chalk more up to the controls and isn't an issue in Armored Core 6 at all. The UI in menus is also far, far better, which is extremely important for a game where you will be in the menus for a big portion of the time. The shop is properly separated from the garage, making it so that's easier to know what you do and don't have. They also move the arena to the main mission screen, thank god making it far easier to notice and offers great rewards like parts, money, and tuning points. It's also connected to the story in a way we will talk about later, making it actually important to do. Even though much hasn't actually changed and going from one game to the next will be very similar since realistically it is the same game, this one just feels much better to play. The world design is admittedly still empty, but visually more interesting with improved graphics that are a little cooked in some places. Look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the. <laughs> no, 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 no. Look at the top of his head! <laughs> and much more interesting locations to fight in, often revisiting places from the previous game, which is pretty cool to see again. Sadly, these places are still empty, making far more sense given the world's now desolated state, which, um, 
Yeah, it, it's just an in-world explanation I use to cope for the lack of details so the game can be speed as it is. Places do get populated, however, when fighting for answers regular enemies, as well as armed forts, which are huge mobile platforms with demanding presence you fight, frequently making even you, a giant armored core, feel tiny in comparison. Then making you feel equally as large when you put one down. It's helped a lot with the game's really, really good OST across the board. There are various tracks varying from fully electronic to others using guitars and orchestras as well, all of which are fed into the game's really fast arcade gameplay. Most of these are even stuck in my head now because they are so good. led to me discovering Armor Core had a group made in house called Frequency that made a lot of this, and it's once again really really good and you can find it on Spotify. On the topic of the sound, voice acting is way better here with actually good lines delivered well and NPCs that talk more in missions, making them feel more alive. Our standard weapons are useless! Where are our normals? Interior transport reporting. So you're our escort today? Good luck to both of us. This was the best I could do. You best turn tail and run, Wang Xiaolang. The battlefield is not a place for scheming old men. Of course, there are a few outliers that are so bad I laughed. Energy flow is reversing from the AMS. Oh, that's really bad. <laughs> pretty funny to me when fighting NPCs as well, the AI really isn't the greatest of it all. Without spoiling anything right now, I've had bosses genuinely fall off the map and kill themselves at the end of the game. If you know, you know. However, one thing I actually did miss out on when it comes to NPCs are friendly AI. During some mission, your client authorizes the use of support units that take a cut of the pay. Some of these units are actually major characters with dialogue I think most people will miss like me because I am greedy and I like money. There's also a bit of an issue with how vertical this game can get, where some bosses or enemies will just fly off the map, which I chased, sometimes causing me to lose because I fled the area. Which is weird because to my knowledge this is something they already fixed in the Ace Combat series? It's definitely something they did look at and fix in today's game, Armored Core 6, but the biggest improvement of 4Answer lies in its story, which unlike Armored Core 4, is actually really good and had me invested the whole way through. The game starts off with us as an independent or sponsored mercenary known as Strayed, working with our operator Serene Hayes. 
a former original next pilot you can fight in Armored Core 4, over 10 years after the end of the game. Where the world, as a result of the war, is a barren wasteland that has very little habitable or farmable space. The corporations decided to form a new group known as the League of Rule Corporations, because another group could never ever go wrong, and anyone who could fled up into the atmosphere onto giant colony ships known as cradles meant to save humanity. However, they left half of the population behind as well as the lynxes that they used to fight each other and continued to employ their services to fight each other through another service they established the Collard, a system that serves as a mediary between them for their jobs. While in reality, it's just another way for them to fight each other while keeping their hands clean and to keep a leash on the people that could harm them on the ground, avoiding another situation like Anatolia's mercenary. In another effort to avoid an issue such as them, they created arms forts, giant weapons platforms crewed by, well, let's let them explain it. The League has focused on maintaining complete and utter control. They agreed this goal could never be entrusted to any single person, who if eliminated could jeopardize their reign. So in the aftermath of the Lynx War, the League manufactured enormous battle stations called arms forts. Manned by a crew of thousands of expendable soldiers, this was military might the League could control and therefore trust. Arms forts have become the perfect solution to the League's needs, and their firepower far and away surpasses the average next. Dream and hope as they might, the next pilots know that those who dare take on giants rarely live to tell the tale. Unlike the Lynxes, this is a controllable power with devastating ability to not only wage war on any nation, but also destroy and kill any problematic Lynx who doesn't want to join the Collard or has become an issue. Fighting these guys border on annoying to fun. Some are you just throwing ammo at a giant thing till it dies, while others are really dynamic with the fort actually falling apart as you tear into it. We are one of those Collard, fighting not only to make a name for yourself, but also for straight up survival on our dying planet. So after picking if he wants to be an independent or corporately sponsored mercenary, which changes the next we start with, we take jobs for the corpse against each other for most of this chapter. From escorting a convoy, intercepting a fleet, or assassinating fellow next pilots, we do whatever will pay the best and gain us the most favor with each group so they can start asking for us directly. One detail about this story setup is that you will want to play through this game at least three times as there are actual mission trees and three endings like the new Armored Core. I didn't even know about the mission tree until looking it up, but the way this game's story is set up is there are proper story important missions that will show up 100% of the time and mission trees determining what jobs you will get, giving the game way more playability and providing a little more personality to the corpse that don't care if you live or die. They also have much, much better personality with their voice actors doing a really good job to make them feel as unique, as well as briefings being edited in a different way based on each corporation, often feeling like almost an advertisement with distinct branding to get you on the job. Here's the mission. Our client is GA America. Your target is the PAN-51 new resource plant. This mission is simple. Take out the defenses, and destroy the plant. There is one catch, however. You must complete the mission within the specified time frame. I suppose the big shots have their reasons for choosing the links of your caliber. There will be bonuses for completing the mission in as short a time as possible. This is a chance for you to make some extra cash. And that's about it. You could do worse, right? Let us know if you want the job. This will be your mission. The client is Omer Science Technology. You are to destroy the Silent Avalanche Force. They're stationed at Sphere, a BFF-owned large-scale Kojima energy facility. At one time, the Avalanche Force was stronger than standard next. They are armed with high-caliber sniper cannons, which make for effective long-range weapons. However, their machines are now considered obsolete. There's a possibility the enemy will deploy ECM in defense, but don't let that slow you down. How you deal with it is up to you. That is all. With this job, you can reinforce ties with Omer Science Technology. It should prove financially rewarding as well.
One thing to know before we start, I will be using mostly hard mode gameplay, as hard mode adds a ton of new enemies that are actually pretty story important. It'd be kind of weird to bring them back into the story with editing, so we're gonna be using mostly hardcore, besides a few parts where hard actually can spoil it, so I'll leave some bits out for the sake of storytelling. Chapter 1 starts off with our first job, and that's to show some force against a group known as Linearch, an independent nation which does not want to deal with corporate rule. Despite the corporation's power, the reason they can't kill them is actually simple. Anatolia's mercenary joined up with them after the war, taking up the mantle of White Glint, which we see in the opening. It's only him being gone why we even have the chance to take down these poor fools. Not really a challenge, but it's really just a test run to see if we're worth it. After showing we're somewhat capable, we continue to get more jobs from the various groups such as Global Armaments America, the Interior Union, and Omer being our main clients. These jobs vary from attacking agriculture plants, assassinating a new next pilot called Wonderful Body, who obviously is new to the game. What? Why is he moving like that? Who cares? Close in and take him down. Don't get to Wait a second. Next move like that? So what are we doing? even defending a cradle under attack by a terrorist force. During these missions, we get to see how little they care for the lynxes on the ground, often using experimental equipment that may or may not work, like the attack on Arms for Gigabase, where we use an overt booster that almost explodes when using it to get close. The OP malfunction detected. It's about to explode. Initiating emergency purge. Prepare for combat. Those interior bastards. What are we? making our handler feel like we're just being treated as a test dummy for the client's petty plans. Plans that end in us either destroying key arms forts, Spirit of Motherwill belonging to GA America, or Algebra's Cabricant, an arms fort that is actually easy to defeat, but has so many drones, like what am I looking at? Either way you go, a major military asset is destroyed, rightfully catching the attention of many groups that give us more and more missions as the fight rages on and gets more intense. We take down more arms forts like the giant Great Wall, which is actually not a wall, it's more like the train from Cabinary to Iron Fortress, and kill key members of the Corps Armored Corps forces such as Illness Ornstein, a commander of Algebra's forces. More mysteriously is we start to get jobs to deal with unknown lynxes and necks attacking key installations, like an agriculture plant, or here in this kind of weird low poly highway in the middle of nowhere, where we actually run to this game's version of Patches, who runs away like Swinborn Armor Core 6 if we kill his allies. Wait, 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 I, I give up! Hey, I, I'm just following orders here. If, if he's pulled out, why should I? You guys, you're still alive, right? This is no count, come in! We're allies, right? Right? So what's the plan? I'll let you decide. This whole thing is absurd. These attacks, based on dialogue, also seem to be somewhat organized and not just the action of a few rogue lynxes. So now here, we have to make a huge distinction. Armor Corps for Answer, like as mentioned before, has three endings, with us being railroaded into the base league ending, which we will talk about first. And as a side note, I actually think Armored Core 6 should have done the same thing, railroading us into one route and then giving us those special optional missions for the Liberation Front, which we'll see later. I'll make it clear, you need to do these, as they unveil information in a really interesting way. But for now, we'll take the job to attack Line Arc and kill White Glint. We had deploy along with our ally Oldstrava a high-ranking Omer Lynx who has a big ego and mouth. You can fight. I'll give you that. All those fancy aerial maneuvers won't save you. White Glint. All those silly legends. They die today. I've surpassed you, and now I'll prove it. Who from his bio isn't too keen to be with Omer anymore, but he joins us to gank the hell out of the last protagonist. This fight is stupidly fast, and a tad difficult if you aren't used to combat yet, since White Glint is made to be as fast and deadly as possible. One thing I love about this fight is they committed to keeping our boy silent and brought back our old handler Fiona to talk for him during the battle, asking us if we're just another corporate slave like we were back in the previous game. You are the same as we once were. Think. What are you fighting for? 
matter how well you do here, White Glint cheats and one-shots Strava out of nowhere, despite the fact he's been talking smack the whole fight, forcing us into a 1v1. Please leave. I know how this will end. Main booster malfunction. Is that what you were aiming for? I've hit the water. Boosters won't engage. Home breach. Damn it, I'm taking on water. No, I can't go down here. Not now. Just like that? Unbelievable. A duel we like ultimately one. win. Dooming Linark, one of the only refuges in resistance to corporate tyranny, defenseless against the League, might taking the previous protagonist and last link of Anatolia out of the fight, proving our loyalty and resolve to the League. Not wanting to waste time, the infighting begins again with us fighting the corpse. Business as usual. We take down key necks, Red Rum and Starka, two pushovers and a kind of bad snowstorm, a fleet, some facilities and an awful snowstorm, and finish off Line Arc's power supply Megalis, which you might actually remember for Armored Core 4, cementing security for the cradles. Or so they thought. This is the mission. The client is Rosenthal Corporation. Your assignment is to protect the large-scale Arteria facility, Carpals. We've received intelligence it will be attacked by several unknown nexts. Our current information is unconfirmed and possibly unreliable. However, as Carpals is one of the key facilities supporting the Cradle system, it goes without saying, the client is taking no chances in its defense. Rosenthal, for the first and actually only time in for answer, contacts us to help defend Arteria Carpals, a type of facility dedicated to protecting and supporting the Cradles from an attack by unknown necks, along with their ace, Noblesse Oblige, piloted by a man known as Geralt. We are informed that we are to deploy to help the heavily armored fortress that will provide fire support, but also to expect heavy resistance, as Carpals is likely being attacked by a group of necks due to that firepower. When arriving, however, we find that Carbals has already been taken and thoroughly destroyed, and not by a group, but by a single Nex. Our Sterism, piloted by Julius Emery. Given her skills to take this place out alone, she's gotta be tough. I except she isn't, uh, for two reasons. One is her build kinda sucks, to be honest, and the other is we're ganking her with Geralt, making her go down really quick which causes another Nex to do an insane kamikaze attack with primal armor, trying to take us down with a single attack. His main strategy is to run you down and primal armor you, which is actually very, very deadly, meaning your best option is to let him go for oblige or gun him down ASAP, which isn't hard given his AC has very low health and armor. The important part of him being here is what he reveals during the fight. Julius Emery defeated like that, and Maltzel somehow saw it coming. But it's too late now. Arteria Carpals belongs to Orca now. A group known as Orca was behind the attacks, and likely the other mysterious attacks we dealt with before. Orca Brigade, now finally in the light, makes an announcement. For many, the chaos began in July. Without warning, multiple nexts of unknown origin unleashed a coordinated attack on Arteria facilities. The majority of these attacks were successful. The energy reserves upon which the cradles relied were suddenly threatened. The Orca leader, a man known as Maximilian Thermidor, made an announcement to the world. The message was simple. League dogs, welcome to Earth. To the people who lived in the skies, it was nothing less than a declaration of war. The League was forced to abandon the tried and true strategies of the economic war. Suddenly, people realized that against these revolutionaries, their mighty castles were actually built out of sand. The corporations finally have a real threat to their rule, a shadow organization led by Maximilian Thermidor totally not a villain name, putting the needs of humanity first, understandably having the support of most people planet side. This leads to everyone in the League banding together to deal with the threat. Even GA and Taurus, two corps who left the League, returned, being put on the front lines of combat as punishment. 
We help all the fronts of the battle where we are needed, from defending Cradle 3 from a force led by someone as the Old King, a man looking to kill millions, to engaging Orca's arms forts head on. We keep up this fighting till the League discovers key installations. Our first being the reactivated anti-satellite cannons which Orca intends to use, by powering them by rerouting the Cradle's power sources essentially forcing them to the ground. We are ordered to stop this by destroying the cannons and killing any and all Orca forces. We fight through them in one of their links is Neonitis, a man who isn't too hard to kill but reveals that the leader of Orca, Maximilian Thermidor, holds us in high regards. After killing him, a new autonomous target hops on the radar, a prototype next, specifically the one Joshua O'Brien used to attack Anatolia, recovered and repaired by Orca, which is actually not as scary as it seems, as in this day and age, it's considered a bit of an outdated relic. It's the same fight as before when you can just spam attacks to evade its mediocre damage. The most interesting part of it was it was supposed to be piloted by someone known as Hari based on some cut dialogue. This is worth noting, because he's in the game later, but only in the arena. His story actually does have a little arc where he's supposed to die in an Arteria facility, and actually plot important thing that comes up a lot. Only issue is this is from AC Visual Works, and people who know me will know that while I appreciate lore and art books, I don't like it being required reading you have to buy outside of the game to get the story. So I'm not a big fan of this, and I won't be including too much AC Works in this video. Regardless, our next target is revealed to be a location known as Big Box, Orca's main base. GA's former HQ before the cradles were made where they eventually ended up. Big Box is quite literally a big box that is heavily armed and armored, defended by two high-ranking members of Orca known as Mazel and Voa. This is actually the fight where one of the next actually just fell off the map, <laughs> making it a really easy victory when it should have been one of the hardest. After wiping out Orca's forces, Orca leadership seems to be destroyed and backed into a corner only for the League to suddenly pull out and make a deal with Orca. The fighting concentrated on the world's largest Arteria facility, the Cranium, with both the League and Orca seeking to wrest control from each other. But in the final moments of the fierce battle, the League's attitude shifted dramatically. Seemingly overnight, they began to disengage from the conflict. It was a secret pact. The League agreed to turn a blind eye to Orca. In return, Orca would protect the Corporation's leaders and keep their dark secrets. It turned out that the Orca leadership were as calculating as their corporate rivals. Their own security came first. They also knew well that the aftermath of the widespread destruction would spur the reins of economic growth. Now, nothing could stop Orca. A deal where the League turns a blind eye to Orca, and Orca, in return, protects the corporation's leadership and secrets. Orca seemingly welcoming the spoils of war. Something that seems really off considering what they seem to stand for this whole time. Wendy Falchon, a recurring character you can have support you and a high-ranking member of Collard. Here's news of Orca looking to capture Arteria Cranium, the most important place where whoever controls it can control where the power for the Cradles actually go, likely planning to force the Cradles down, potentially and likely leading to the slow deaths of many, likely millions upon millions and even billions. The League, however, tells us not to do anything about it, which causes her to go rogue and contact us to stop them. We do as much, only being opposed by the leader of Orca, Maximilian Thermidor, and Shinkai, both using equipment from a long-dead corporation, Raelianard. This fight actually had me stuck for a while as Thermidor is an easy kill, Shinkai is really really fast, and his melee can melt you in like a couple of hits. Given this is at a tight quarter, it's really hard to avoid, but eventually we prevail, saving the people in the cradles and preserving the League. Except the end here is given like a eulogy, something only for dead people. Maltzel fell at Big Box, and Maximilian Thermidor at Cranium. In an instant, the backbone of Orca was broken. The League rewarded their Link saviors with glowing eulogies. 
they hunted down the remnants of Orca and once again secured the dignity of their rule. We have at long last restored peace to our world, they proclaimed. The cradles continued to float serenely above the planet. Within them, people soon forgot the terrible danger that had threatened their existence. Meaning, either A, we died in the cranium after the intense fight, or B, the League got rid of us for being problematic. But this is only one side of the story, and not a full view of the events at hand, meaning we had to run it back. Our first changes show up after dealing with the spirit of Motherwill or the Cambrican. If defeating the spirit of Motherwill, you will see that Wendy Falchion and the other ranking Kalard members have noticed us. But it also reveals that Orca's moving already at this point in the game, with one destroying Arteria. What about the ones who attacked Arteria? We managed to launch a surprise attack on a cradle facility in broad daylight with complete impunity. Their leaders must be punished severely. Indeed. If you cannot follow the rules, then you cannot be allowed to play the game. It's the same whether you are Reinhardt or the ghost of Reinhardt himself. Obviously Hari's plot. Destroying the Cabricon, on the other hand, gets Orca's attention, all of which are surprised we actually did it, while plotting in the background, providing us with the info that Hari, who we mentioned earlier, was actually responsible for the destruction of the Arteria, but also that Thermidor is actually not present at Orca. Take down the Cabricon? Is that even possible? It depends. I might just have to take off his leash and find out. You mean like what happened with Hari? Is that what we want, Lonzo? Don't worry, Julius. Maximilian Thurmador will return to us shortly. Then we will be ready. Continuing on this route, we are contacted during Act 1 by Linark, and Strayed, being sympathetic, accepts these missions. These lead to us defending Linark and their various installations, discovering that Linark isn't just an anti-established group looking to destroy the Cradles, but people who want to be free from corporate slavery and not doomed like everyone on Earth seems to be. Unfortunately, this led to internal struggles such as this welcoming mindset causing a lot of unsavory types to show up in the Ark. It's a fragile ecosystem that is once again shattered when we in this case defend Linark with White Glint against Ostrava and a new next known as Fragile. Slimy politicians with all their empty calls to arms in the name of liberty. <laughs> I'll sink the whole lot of you to the bottom of the ocean. You ready, Fragile? Preparations complete. Hmm, good to hear. Move out. Once again, we are the sole survivor of the Line Arc incident with us getting another caller conversation where they're very much panic over the situation at hand and the difficulty of finding the culprits behind the attacks. Culprits that decide to contact us directly. Greetings, Maximilian Thermidor here. We want you to infiltrate GA America's Arteria facility, Ulna, and destroy it. This mission flies in the face of everything the Cradles stand for and will be considered an act of treason. With that understood, I want you to listen to what I tell you. Some fled to the cradles and live in the clean air. Others were abandoned, condemned to the Earth's poisonous surface. Maintaining this system is causing horrible pollution on the surface. That pollution will soon start bleeding into the atmosphere itself. The cradles are only a stopgap measure, a panacea. Humankind has no future on this planet unless we stop them. Perhaps you think I'm an alarmist, but I speak the truth. If you believe in what I say, then you must take this mission. Thermidor wants us to attack an Arteria facility as proof of loyalty to Orca since any attack of one of them is a direct attack on the Cradles. Destroying the facility has Orca welcome us with open arms, and now we have no way to back from the path we have chosen, our answer.
Siding with Orca also gives us access to Orca's arena, providing us with important information on who the members really are. As we guessed before, the mysterious lynxes we fought earlier are in this arena, although now they're dead it at least confirms the suspicion, along with a few other details. Namely, Orca was established by Maisel and Thermidor, with funding and support from Omer, a key player throughout this war in the last. Maisel wants to execute something known as the Close Plan, which at this point is unknown exactly what it is. Moving along, we instead attack our Piria Carpals by ourselves again, instead being part of Orca's surprise offensive. We are given proper time to destroy the facility before Noblesse Oblige arrives, who we kill here along with a man known as Dario, another key member to Rosenthal, reducing their manpower significantly. Fun fact, he and Oblige take the same route that we do when we attack the place. Meaning, if you try hard enough, you could actually one-shot him as soon as he arrives with Kojima cannons or real guns. With very little to oppose us, we move to the last parts of this plan. Firstly, we have to defend the cannons we previously destroyed, while being supported by Neo Nidus. Our attackers are two necks, Wong Shaolong and Lilia Molkot, two people we've heard in Collard Secret Conversations, along with a flying arms fort which is really easy to kill, but really annoying to reach when it does fly out of bounds. These forces prove to not be a threat to us anymore after all we've experienced, with the support of Orca, and go down just like the others before them. It's here we're given the truth of the close plan. The corpse ruined not just Earth, but trapped us here. During their conflicts, satellites were launched into the sky to shoot down anything trying to leave. So many are now up there that no one can leave at all, essentially meaning the cradles will eventually pollute Earth to the point of no return, including the atmosphere they live in, dooming them as well. The close plan was thus established, not by Omer, but by Raelianard. It's heavily implied that the attack by four Raelianard next from Armored Core 4 was actually an attempt to execute said plan. After Raelianard gets destroyed and Omer gets a hold of what's left over from the staff, they start to fund Orca to execute it. Not just to get rid of the satellites, but also to have what is essentially first picks to a monopoly on space, making talk of the ghost of Raelianard an actual thing across the entire timeline. We even find proof of these satellites way back in Chapter 1, during Take Back Cradle 21 from the Old King's Men. If you fly up as high as possible, you can see specs far closer than any star. If you go up to 9200 meters, they fire at you, but you're way out of range. At 9900, Serene tells us to back off because it's dangerous. There's now just one last threat to the closed plan, the arms fort answer. This is This thing looks like an Evangelion angel or some sort of Ava, and it is absolutely a sight to behold. A sight that will kill you in a moment, making this seem more and more like a suicide mission. If you don't have the energy available, you, you can't even get up to it. The best chance I had was to use Moonlight and melee all the weapons and get to the top to kill it, slowly whittling it down, avoiding the primal armor expansion. After destroying the answer, we are given one last conversation between the Orca members. Conversation showing us, even Orca leadership is being sent on suicide missions for the cause. Although it's worth noting, Thermidor sounds different.
Russian will probably be leading their forces. That may be... I might not come back. But we all have to die sometime. Our final mission to free humanity is to attack Arteria Cranium, alone now that we are allegedly the last member of Orca left, but can still complete the mission. Arriving at the facility, we are met by Wendy Falchon and Roy Salant, taking the role we had in the same position. They, however, aren't as important as the man who joins the battle. Our base has been destroyed. Thermidor, you betrayed us. This was your fight to begin with. The man called Thermidor has already passed. The man standing before you is rank one, hot star. Thermidor, or more accurately, Outstrava, joins the battle for Omer to clean up all of us, removing the problematic Orca and Rogue Collard here, giving Omer freedom to take the credit for it all. Unfortunately for him, as the last member of the organization he built and tried to bury, we kill them all and activate the Cranium. Humanity will lose millions, and potentially billions in the aftermath we caused, but fortunately, now there's actually a path forward into space for humanity once the dust settles, leaving a world for future generations. Unlike the League ending, where eventually humanity is doomed to die, stuck on Earth. But, but, but um, why exactly did Ostrava betray us when he decided to stay with Orca in the League path? Well, this is speculation, and it's kind of obvious when looking into his arena bio. He's estranged from Omer and not actually sure about what he's doing. The attack on White Glint, which wasn't too long ago, was his return to Orca, after Ostrava goes down in an implied secret conversation. I personally believe it's your actions that made him switch over to Omer's side. It's obvious now that Thermidor was sending Orca members to their death, and that Orca was just a way to get the plan off, while getting rid of any problematic individuals in the process. But he likely decided to work with Orca after doing everything he did, maybe feeling a little bit of guilt. In the route where we side with him, however, we proved the corpse fear of a single Nex being able to do this much damage after destroying the Answerer, and decide to cut Orca off for good and agree with Omer's plan. Meaning that no matter what route we chose, there's no escape from the lies, schemes, plans, and influence of the corporations. We were always just dancing to their tune one way or another. But what if there was a way we can escape all of that and do something we want to, and not be influenced by any of the others? The Old King offers us as much with the Root of Destruction. The Old King is a man who, through unknown means after joining Orca after we destroy his group, learns Ostrava's true identity, and decides to go with his own plan. This mission isn't even a challenge, it's just mindless violence where we kill a hundred million people, an act that disgusts our handlers who at this point has treated us like a student. She understandably leaves us. The Old King meanwhile adores this killing, revealing that Orca's freedom fighting was likely just an excuse for his desire to kill as many as possible, a bloodlust we inherit. One note about this mission is I think the one thing it could have benefited from was having some voice lines from either the next defending it or the people on board as you destroy this. It's a really, really grim request and kind of crazy, but I think it would have made the effect of you killing this many people make more sense. One hundred million. Done. There are still so many more lives to take. Our journey. Just beginning. Getting back, we get a mission from the Union of all groups. The objective is to take control of the large-scale Arteria facility, Carpals. This time, the details of the operation are up to you. You are to simply take out anyone or anything that gets in your way. Briefing over. The Union seeks only to secure the future safety of humanity and the planet. This mission is an essential step in realizing that goal. We trust that you will meet with 100% success. It's clear when getting to Kapral's, it was just a trap. An honestly obvious one at that. 
sent by the Union and your former handler to kill you and the old king. The mission is really, really hard as it throws five necks at you and I had to cheese it to beat it. I, I genuinely don't know how people beat this legit or how I would have as a kid and salute you if you manage to do it. This is easily the hardest fight in the entire series to me and it's a fitting finale when you manage to down every single Nex, leaving no one to stop the rampage and bloodshed that will come, becoming the greatest monster mankind has ever known, causing death and destruction and ruining the world yourself. Soon after, the blood of the innocents would rain down from the cradles all at the hands of a single lynx. One who will be the greatest monster mankind has ever seen, taking more lives than any other in history. A slight spoiler for my upcoming Armor Core 5 video, but this is the canon ending, which, which is kind of funny considering it's the only ending to not get a proper cutscene. And that's how one of the best mecha games, and 4, end. A game that really knew what it wanted to be and executed it almost perfectly. It has everything a person like me wants from mecha. Speed, plots, big enemies, and big weapons. And if you're new to the franchise or looking to replay the games, I can't recommend you going through this game enough. It was a blast going back to the past playing something I vaguely remember and appreciating and loving it even more because of it. I was really pleasantly surprised to see not just the game mostly hold up, but remain really really good throughout the years. I'll admit, a few of the story beats aren't exactly the greatest, such as Omer being behind almost everything with very little buildup, opposed to Archimus' rise in Armor Core 6, which is built up pretty well. I know there are tons of descriptions in outside media describing this, and I do like Dark Souls like storytelling, but I feel it wasn't executed super well here. But even then, it was still really, really good, and it is just a nitpick as the different story routes more than make up for it. I'm a little sad I didn't get to try the multiplayer for, for well, the obvious reasons. But from what I can tell and remember, it was pretty fun. I'm really glad the Armor Core is back nowadays and the major success of 6 making FromSoft allegedly intend to make more. I know it's not really their thing, but on top of new games, I'd actually really like to see at least a 4 answer remake or remaster, maybe even combining 4 and 4 answer into one game so more people can experience this as I think people would really like it in today's current gaming environment. A final note for me, if you made it this far, Thank you so much, and I appreciate each and every one of you. This guy, due to a couple situations, took a bit longer than it should have, but was great regardless. I'm close, maybe even had 101k subs at this point, so I'd greatly appreciate it if y'all did all that sub and crap jazz if you'd like to see more from me. Next, I'm finally going to check out what a lot of people consider the worst Armored Core games. Five in Verdict Day. So I'll see you then, and while you wait, I have a decent library of stuff to watch now. I'm especially proud of my AC6 video, and if you want, you could even join our Discord channel. Have a good day, night, or wherever you so are.